fate of you who are listening, of nations, of the world, has often hung upon accident or upon decisions that made any other way would have substantially altered the course of human events. Suppose, by a stroke of fate, Shakespeare had died before writing his great plays. What if fate had decreed there had been no monitor to defeat the Merrimack in the war between the states? Would continued destruction of Union shipping have led to Confederate triumph? Yes, much depends upon a stroke of fate. And tonight we partially rewrite history as we present a dramatic conception of what might have happened if, by a stroke of fate... There had been a different ending to a battle that determined the future of Canada and the United States. The Battle of Quebec. Our story is historically true up to the stroke of fate, which might have changed history. After that, speculation based on historical possibility. Our story is told through the lips of two noble men, the small, keen-eyed, nervous Marquis de Montcalm, general of the French forces guarding Quebec and the tall, thin, red-haired British general, James Wolfe. It is the year 1759, and I, James Wolfe, have returned to North America as commander of the British expedition whose mission is to capture Quebec. For three years, on three continents, France and my country, England, have been at war. France is well entrenched in the New World, and her position as mistress of Canada affects the destiny of our American colonies, indeed, of all of North America. To take Canada, we will first have to capture the gateway to these northern provinces, the nearly impregnable city of Quebec, a natural fortress built high atop a rock, difficult if not impossible to scale, and overlooking the twisting, treacherous channels of the broad and swift St. Lawrence River. It is in June 1759 that a vast armada under my command sails up the St. Lawrence River on its desperate journey towards Quebec. I have been pacing my cabin reading Thomas Gray, one of my favorite poets. Oh, sir? Oh, yes, Captain Knox. <laughs> Admiral Saunders just showed me <laughs> the most delightful report that just came from London. Of special interest to you, General. Uh, may I tell you the story, sir? I'm quite sure I couldn't stop your telling it, Knox, short of a direct command. <laughs> well, uh, the Duke of Newcastle was uh, complaining to His Majesty about the size of the force entrusted to you at uh, your young age. <laughs> oh, that man Wolf is an enigma, uh, said Newcastle. And yet to trust him at the age of 32, with command of 249 ships under three admirals, 1,800 of our best soldiers... 17,000 sailors and marines... I am and quite I... familiar with the size of my force, Knox. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Your Majesty, I think that Wolf is mad. A wolf is mad. And the king answered... Oh, now no doubt you will imitate the king. And the king said to Newcastle, sir... Mad is Wolf. Mad is he. Well, well, well. Then I hope that Wolf will bite... Some of my other generals. <laughs> Very amusing. You know, someday, Knox, I hope you'll put your talents as an actor to military use. Uh, yes, sir. Look, Knox. Pick up your glasses. Come here. Uh, yes, sir. There. There stands the city on that high rock. Quebec the inviolate. Look there, Knox. Many thousands of Montcalm's troops ready for us eastward of the city... And to the west, too, no doubt. And Quebec itself, a bastion on a rock no army could ever ascend. I wonder what General Montcalm's plans are for its defense. I, Louis-Joseph de Montcalm, Gozon, Marquis de Montcalm, find myself in the most difficult and equivocal position at Quebec. My commission as Major General assigns to me only the command of the regular French troops. The military resources of Canada, including the Canadian troops, which forms the greater number of defenders of Quebec, are under the command of the governor, le Marquis de Vaudreuil. I am also unfortunately subordinate to Monsieur de Vaudreuil and subject to his caprices, to his interference in the military defense of the city. And I confess I have but little liking for this man who fancies himself a military genius, but is incompetent. 
On this July day, accompanied by my aide Bougainville, I hurried to the governor's palace to find the distinguished governor de Vaudreuil amusing himself. <laughs> ah, it is our general Marquis de Montcalm. Have you come to join our festivities? Governor Vaudreuil, have you forgotten our council of war? <laughs> oh, beautifully you dance, my dear wife. Does not Madame la Marquise de Vaudreuil dance gracefully, Monsieur le Général? <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> the governor of Canada is more interested in the party than in war, General de Montcalm. So I see. Permit me. Uh, Governor de Vaudreuil, huh? I have just given to General de Montcalm a report on... Uh, Colonel Bougainville, uh, you have another report. I have drawn a map, sir, showing how General Wolfe has disposed of his forces. Uh, and... Then do not bother to tell me, Colonel, you are General Montcalm's aide de camp, not mine. Uh, Governor ah, de Vaudreuil, I have been trying to tell you that Wolfe has taken Point Levy, directly opposite the city. He has placed batteries of artillery there and is now in position to bombard the city. Wolfe has done that, well, then, I, Vergor, uh, Captain Vergor. Yes, uh, yes, monsieur. Yes, uh, Governor Vergor. I... The British are worrying General Montcalm here. Vergor, I want you to reassure General Montcalm. We cannot have our friends in for dancing and supper without General de Montcalm and his tiresome councils of war constantly interrupting. Madame de Vaudreuil, how many more festivals do you think you and your husband, the governor, will be able to give with General Wolfe lying below us in the river, occupying Point Levy opposite us, ready to bombard? But I cannot see why you, mon general, have to work. After all, you have your troops encamped to the eastward at Beauport. Your precious Colonel Bougainville here is in command of the forces west of the city. In the center, my own husband, Governor de Vaudreuil, himself guards Quebec with the local Canadian militia. So Madame de Vaudreuil, if my wife were here, she would not interrupt a council of war. My wife would stay silent. <laughs> Well, Marquis de Montcalm... You see, madame, you have angered our general. General Montcalm, you are worried about Wolf. Wolf, he reminds me of a painted soldier on the tavern sign, always mounted, never going any place. <laughs> It's almost mid-July now. What has Wolf done? But all summer, maneuver up and down, up and down the river, afraid to land, afraid to attack, afraid to, um, uh, Vergo. Uh, yes, monsieur. Assure General Montcalm that you will see to it that our own people, our Quebec townsmen themselves, will attack Wolf's batteries at Point Levy. But you dare not send untrained men against the British guns. I dare not. You forget yourself, monsieur. I am the governor. Restrict yourself to your own command. I will send a battalion of regulars. And I forbid it. If the Marquis de Montcalm will permit me, I... To you, Vergo, I permit nothing. You, stealing everything but the bells from the cathedral tower. Corrupt, conniving, thieving. What? Uh, General, look! Through the window there! The cathedral! What happened to the cathedral? It is burning, sir. A British shell from their battery at Point Levy. Well, 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 why all this excitement? This noise? I am afraid, Governor, that is the sound of wolf. Of the painted soldier dismounting from his horse to shake the foundation of New France. <laughs> Governor Vaudreuil actually sent untrained townspeople, including seminary students, to attack us at Point Levy. His men became so confused, they actually fired at each other instead of at us. And then they retreated. After this fiasco, we continued to bombard Quebec. But I knew the bombardment alone could not win for us, the city secure on its heights. I then attempted to take the heights of Montmorency east of Quebec from which point we might attack the city proper. But we were repulsed by Montcalm, who was awaiting us. I feel now that we must attack from another direction, and if possible, come upon the enemy by stealth. It is now September, and my health, never of the best, is undermined by a consuming fever. General Wolfe, you're sitting up, sir. The doctor oh, said... Oh, blast the doctor's knocks. But your fever, sir, is Let high. the fever burn. 
I can have no rest as long as Quebec is not ours. Oh, yes, sir. Knox, but... we've been beaten back east of Quebec. We must strike on land west of the city. Uh, yes, sir. But the success of such a maneuver depends upon our finding a way to scale the heights upon which Quebec stands <coughs> and in surprising the enemy. Knox, get us Grenadiers' uniforms at once. <coughs> Grenadier, sir? Yes. And tomorrow morning, you and I and uh, Grenadiers' uniforms... Doctor, uniform... sir, has given you strict orders to Knox, General. Tomorrow morning... You and I will be rowed up the river past the city to the westward to find a place to locate the spot from which we must... <coughs> we must attack Quebec by land west of the city. day we are rowed from the east of the city, past the heights on which the city itself stands, and to the west of the city where I wish to reconnoiter. We are not even challenged by the sentry on guard where the river St. Lawrence narrows. So what harm could one small boatload of men do? All right, Knox. You may stop rowing, men. <laughs> Let me look at that map again, Knox. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> that Small landing. There, what is it called? The Anse de Foulon, sir. Anse de Foulon. And above it, let me see. Above this little gulf plateau, a level plain. Not very wide, but sir. But wide enough for a frontal attack. <coughs> and for reserves, too. Plains of Abraham. That is it. Look, Knox. These plains of Abraham on the same plateau on which the city of Quebec itself stands. Yes, General... If we could only reach those plains, we could attack Quebec, but... General, the plains of Abraham are way up there at the top of this rock. A rock as difficult to scale as the rock upon which Quebec itself is built. Yes, Knox, but a mile and a half away from these plains is Quebec. This is our place to attack. First two dozen sturdy pick men... <coughs> pick men can climb to the top of that rock, Knox, and silence any sentries that may be on guard. The rest of our men will follow them. But uh, how will we get up there, sir? Knox, Knox, look up there at the top of the rock. Well, well my glass shows me, sir, uh, some laundry hanging from the line there, sir. Yes, some linens hanging from a line. Two things I see in that line. First, there's not a big wash, is there? Well, no, sir, only a about... A small wash indicating that there is only a small force of men up there. Our scouts should be able to overcome them and perhaps prevent them from giving the alarm. Second, a half hour ago, Knox, we both noticed some women, didn't we, doing their wash in the waters of this gulf, right here at the Anse de Foulon. You remember? Oh, yes, sir, I do remember. All right, Knox. Those women did not climb the rock straight to the top. They disappeared there, to the right. <coughs> and now, now they have hung their wash at the top. Which means, Knox, that there is a path to the right of the rock leading straight to the top. Yes, Knox, there is a path and we will take it. It may be a very difficult climb, but climb and we will. And there, Knox, there on the plains of Abraham, we will give Montcalm his battle. <coughs> the battle for Quebec. You are listening to what might have happened if, by a stroke of fate, there had been a different ending to the battle that determined the future of Canada and the United States, the Battle of Quebec. Our story, which has been historically true so far, continues so up to the stroke of fate, which will be explained at the end of the program. From the stroke of fate onward, historical possibility will guide our imagination. the night of September 12th, there is something ominous in the air. For days and nights, I have not taken off my boots. I have not been out of my saddle. All of the regiments that I control, those under my command east of the city, and those I have entrusted to Colonel Bougainville, the west of the city, all of our French forces are on the alert. But in the center, however, the governor of Canada, Governor de Vaudreuil, commands his own forces, the local Canadian militia. If only I had a regiment or two of his men under my command, I would feel more secure. Who is 
is there? In the Val de Montcalm, Governor. Why do you disturb me at this hour, General? Governor de Vaudreuil, I must have Guillen's regiments to guard the plains of Abraham. I need Guillen's regiment, too, to guard the city at a place where... Yes, I know where Guillen and his men are now, miles away from any place where any fighting is likely to occur. Monsieur, only a mile and a half west of the city, there is that plateau called the Plains of Abraham. Now, below those plains, there is the Arce de Foulon, and a pathway up to the plains. If Wolf should discover that More path... Time, it is not necessary to describe this terrain to me as if I were a schoolboy. I am not worried about the Plains of Abraham. A hundred men, only a hundred men could prevent anybody from coming up that path. And have you a hundred men there, Governor? I am not answerable to you, Montcalm. No, you are not. And that Vaudreuil is the misfortune of France. Now, all my forces are extended to their utmost. I have not a battalion to spare. Wolf is disheartened. He will not attack now. You know there is grave danger, and yet you deny me the loan of one regiment. One regiment to guard the plains of I'm Abraham. I'm sorry, my friend. I must return to bed. Good night, mon général. Good night. Scoundrel. Montcalm. General Montcalm. Yes, Governor. Out on the plains of Abraham... Do not worry, General. Vergor is there, Captain Vergor himself, with 100 men. Picked men, Canadian militia men. <laughs> September 12th. It is nearly midnight. Two hundred of our British boats, transports carrying men, guns, ammunition, supplies, are on their way up the St. Lawrence River for the attack of the Anse de Foulon. There at that tiny landing on a small gulf, there we plan to scale the heights to the plains of Abraham, our scouts to overcome the small guard, and then, with the rest of our men following, to bring up our field guns and launch the attack against Quebec itself. But first, at the narrow part of the river, there is a sentry to be passed. He has permitted our small reconnoitering boat to pass before. But now there are 200 boats. That sentry holds in his hands the fate of New France. The wealth of circumstance, the pomp of power, and all that beauty, all that wealth air gave. A waiter like the inevitable hour. The path of glory leads but to the grave. Yes, Knox, I think I had rather written those lines of Gray's elegy than to capture Quebec. Uh, General, we are nearing the narrowest part of the channel. Where one sentry, my dear Knox, one man could fire his musket and rouse Montcalm's garrison so that we might perhaps be destroyed here on the river or at least surely prevented from making a landing at Anse de Foulon. <laughs> it's an appalling thought, is it not? That sentry will never fire that shot, sir. I trust I'll be able to talk him out of such an intention. I trust you will, Knox. Here is where your actor's talent can prove itself. England's hopes in Canada may depend upon it. Thank God it's too dark to see our uniforms. This is the place, sir. Sir, that sentry. One man. Then act, Knox, as never before. You must be an actor for God and country. Chivalrous, man. France! Actuel régiment! De la reine! De la reine! Oui, bête, de la reine! Et toi! Les Anglais nous en entendons! Eh oui, monsieur, pardon! Avancez! En avant, mes amis! Start throwing, men. He's letting us throw to the narrowest point. I congratulate you, Knox, on that extra touch, warning him he better be quiet or the English would hear him. Now we go straight to the Once de Foulon. Straight to our attack without further challenge, sir. Yes, Knox. And then on to Montcalm and Quebec. At the answer to Foulon, at the heights above that small landing, there we French can hold our ground against Wolfe with a hundred men. But there, Governor Vaudreuil's man, the stupid, corrupt, lazy Captain Vergor, a worthy subordinate of an unworthy man. There, Captain Vergor has charge of that most strategic post. Colonel Bougainville, the commanding my troops west of the city, goes shortly after midnight for a final inspection of all the posts west of the city. 
Vergo. Capitaine Vergo. Who cannot let a man sleep? Oh, Colonel Bougainville. To what do I owe the honor of this nocturnal visit? At a time after midnight, when all decent men are in bed. Vergo, I am inspecting all the posts west of the city. Yours is the closest and the most important. You are supposed to have a hundred men here. And I just counted when I woke them up. Exactly twelve. But good Canadian men, Colonel. I have sent the rest to their homes. To their homes? Yes, Colonel. To do the harvesting. And to harvest my crops also. This is September. And... Bougainville immediately detailed several companies of his own riflemen to lie in wait on the plains of Abraham, near where the pathway up the heights ends, to guard against any possible surprise attack. If the British should attempt to scale the heights, there are now sufficient of our men to hold them off until reinforcements should arrive. Fox, our advance parties must have reached the top of the heights by now. Yes, sir. Well, then, let us climb up away. But, sir, would it not be better to at least wait until our advance parties have secured the position on top? Knox, how many... T- no. Well, we failed to catch the enemy unaware. There are not many of them by the sound of it. Perhaps we can take the plains of Abraham before enough of Montcalm's men arrive to stop us. Forward, men! Up the heights! Forward for England! <laughs> Knox, we're beating them back. We'll yet take these planes of Abraham and so... Sir, look. More of their reinforcements. Yes. Very well, Knox. Have Brigadier Monkton bring up the cannon. Ah, sir. Sir, you're hit. No, oh, it's all this. Only the wrist. Give me... Well, let me tie this handkerchief, sir. Yeah. There we are. Let's... Man has two hands, Knox. Now, send another messenger to Brigadier Murray. Murray must at once clear the broad road... <coughs> Sergeant... Sergeant, doctor! This way, the general! General Wolf! Bougainville's companies have delayed Wolf's taking of the plains of Abraham. We are sending reinforcements as rapidly as we can, but Wolf's men have cleared the wide road leading to the heights, enough to bring up some of their cannon. Forward, Grenadiers! Forward! <coughs> oh, my chest. Knox, those fellows can, can shoot. Please, sir. Get on my coat. Lie on my coat, please. Thank you. Thank you, Knox. Well, uh, Colonel Burton's reserves. Don't talk, sir. Please, you must Until my last breath, I'm... <laughs> Set me up, Knox. Yes, sir. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. The, the path of glory leads but General, General de Montcalm, you, you, yes, Colonel Bougainville. I'm dying. I have confessed to the good father here. Oh, General. I uh, have been told that a wolf was killed. Eh? Poor wolf, he... They retreat. Eh? See, si. they retreat. Who, who retreat? The enemy. They've been routed. General, you've won. You've won. Uh, Canada still belongs to France. Then I can die in peace.
ladies and gentlemen, please recall, if you will, this scene in which a stroke of fate occurred that might have changed history and led to the defeat of the British in the Battle of Quebec. Vergor, I am inspecting all the posts west of the city. You are supposed to have a hundred men here. And I just counted when I woke them up. Exactly twelve. But good, honest Canadian men, Colonel. Here to explain what the actual stroke of fate was is our consultant on tonight's program, the noted historian, twice winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Biography, professor of history at Columbia University, Dr. Alan Nevins. Bougainville actually did not inspect the French outpost. It would have been a stroke of fate indeed if he had, nor did he really send several companies to reinforce the 12 sleeping French Canadians. When Wolfe's advance party of 24 clambered to the top, nobody was on guard. On their heels, a long column streamed up the heights. When the rainy morning broke, Wolfe's veterans were massing on the plains of Abraham. He marshaled 3,500 tough soldiers in a solid wall of red, bayonets glistening, bagpipes screaming. When Montcalm's troops appeared, Wolfe was everywhere. Wounded thrice, he roused himself from stupor when an aide shouted, They run! See how they run! The French had broken. Quebec was won. Said Wolfe, God be praised, I die in peace. Because a corrupt French officer had not kept a hundred men on duty in a half-forgotten guard post, New France was conquered, and most of North America passed under British sway. But what if Wolfe had been beaten at Quebec? The Seven Years' War would have ended with the French holding Canada. The American Revolution would have been postponed for one generation, for two. For the American colonies clung to England as long as they feared France. Nay, had a dominion form of government been devised, armed revolution might never have occurred. Washington might have won his fame as a general leading Anglo-American armies in a new war against Canada. In the Napoleonic conflict, American troops might have battled side by side with British forces. The French lost Canada in 1759, but this was not merely because a single slack captain left one path unguarded. That incident was but one small manifestation of their inefficiency. The entire administration was slovenly, dishonest, and faction-ridden. France herself was staggering toward revolution. And once North America was freed of French rule, the independence of the English colonies became part of the inexorable logic of history. Thank you, Dr. Nevins. We invite you to listen next week to hear what might have happened if, by a stroke of fate, we now had Russia as our neighbor in Alaska. Featured in tonight's Stroke of Fate presentation were Ian Martin as General Wolf, Joe DeSantis as General de Montcalm, Chester Stratton appeared as Captain Knox, and Kermit Murdoch as Governor Vaudreuil. Others in the cast were Guy Sorrell, Jane Lauren, and James Monks. Your announcer is Lionel Rico. Stroke of Fate is produced by Martin Lester Lewis in consultation with the Society of American Historians, conceived by Mort Lewis and directed by Fred Way. Tonight's play was written by Saul Carson. This is the NBC Radio Network.